Hello there, YouTube. I am Necrostevo, and you are joining me for week three of season nine of the GBA. Now we're coming off of two victories, and it is time that we face our new opponent, someone that we actually haven't battled before, the Melbourne Rotom, who are coached by Cybertron. Now his information will be in the description, but it is far more likely that you've already heard of him just because of uh, how high his power level is in the Pokemon community. Speaking of which, if you don't want to sit through this entire team builder, there'll be a little timestamp in the description to jump right to the battle, but these never take that long, so let's just jump right into it. You can see Aaron's team over there on the right. He has an Aegislash, a Rayquaza, Mamoswine, Toxapex, Mega Lopunny, Wobbuffet, Kartana, Gligar, Zerkatry, Magmortar, and Azelf to round it out. His Z users are Kartana and Zerkatry, so we went down the Ultra Beast trail for his Z users. And this team, this possibly might be the, the worst matchup that we have all season, bar a couple of other things. And that is predicated solely upon the presence of Aegislash. Now, Aegislash was in my um, my initial team build, my second team build that I had for the draft. So if I had been able to draft it, I wouldn't be in this position. Because being able to breed Pokemon like that is fantastic. But the main issue going up against Aegislash is its ability to be in King Shield and then attack after I throw off a move. I tried everything from going Specs, Hidden Power, Ground, Xerneas, I tried Choice Band, Xerneas, I tried uh, Banded, um, Landorus, but they were just all hitting it while it was in the King Shield form, then taking too much damage as it switched back to the Blade form. So even though I tried a lot of different things there, that was not panning out. In my mock battles, uh, shoutouts to PK Kingdom, or P Kingdom, excuse me, uh, and Aiden for helping me with a lot of different mock scenarios there and just team building and, and helping me bounce ideas around. Because I lost so many mock battles to Aegislash. But here is the team today. This is what I settled on. So up first we have our dedicated lead, which is Rotom Mo. I have enough speed to outspeed his Mamoswine. And the rest is just in bulk. The idea being, um, I can basically live any hit that his team goes for, bar something unlikely like it would need to be uh and if it is something unlikely it makes it a lot easier for my team for example um say he has a a, a banded rayquaza and he goes for um dragon ascent that right there will knock out this rotom set and even then it's a roll but that type of scenario is great for me because not only do i know the damage immediately but then I get a chance to set up with something in the back. So Rotom is designed to not only help me scout out initially, but it can take any hit and hopefully neuter something. Now, since Rotom is our lead, if he leads Kartana, I immediately hidden power fire. If he leads with Mamoswine, I immediately Will-O-Wisp. And basically I Will-O-Wisp anything else bar Azelf. If Azelf is the lead, I will click Thunder Wave. Now, there's a few reasons for that. Azelf can set up a nasty plot and decimate my team, especially if I go for Leaf Storm and I'm minus two special attack. He can set up a, a nasty plot and then KO my Rotom with a Flamethrower or a Fire Blast. I also don't want to go for Leaf Storm early because his Rayquaza, his Mega Law Punny, his Kartana, and his Zerkatry can all come in on that and set up. And so Leaf Storm is more there to dissuade Mamoswine from doing anything. And it'll also help protect me against the the unlikely things like a setup mammal swine, like a cursed mammal swine, or something like that. Um, I did tool around with reflect a little bit, but it just ended up wasting turns and times. Like things still got set up, I and mean, we still did damage. I'd rather just neuter them outright. So Rotom will be our dedicated lead for that scenario. After that, I really have to play around his team depending on what he brings, because. He brought the same two teams the first two weeks, which were his Aegislash, Rayquaza, Mamoswine, Megalopony, Kartana, and Zerkatry. He could totally bring that against me. I'm assuming he would assume that I would have watched those battles, and so 
just preparing for those six would be foolhardy. And things like the Toxapex, they aren't great against me, but they have their niche, especially if I have, since I have things like Xerneas, rather. Um, and something like the Gligor or the Magmortar could be annoying with the right set, such as an Assault Vest Magmortar or a kind of like a bulky pivot Gligar with Roost. Like, things like that could be very annoying. Because of that, that is why I decided to go with an offensive Charizard this week with our Dragon Dance, Flare Blitz, Dragon Claw. I'm sorry, not Dragon Claw. I decided on Outrage. I did decide on Outrage just because of the Rayquaza and Roost. Outrage is needed to one-shot the Rayquaza and nothing else on his team wants to come in on an Outrage. If Aegislash comes in and he King Shields, then I get out of confusion, which is great. And in, my, in the last few mocks I did, I was able to set up on the Aegislash. Uh, even if it's a max special attack, he can do around 60 with his uh, Shadow Ball. And so I can Roost stall that a little bit and get into a position to where I get Dragon Dances up in case he has a Scarfer in the back. Now, after that, I have an Assault Vest Tentacruel. This is our one of our first soft checks to Aegislash and the Toxapex, to a lesser extent than Mega Lop Honey. Um, this overall spread here is just to, number one, allow me to outspeed Mammal Swine. I didn't find it important enough to outspeed Rayquaza because then I'd have to lose a lot of bulk there. But uh, with that specific build, I have something to hit everything on his team just about. And of course, Rapid Spin support in case he tries to get up rocks. I don't see him prioritizing rocks here necessarily because Charizard is kind of an iffy bring against him. But if he has it, then I can at least prepare for it. After Charizard, we have a really interesting spread on our Xerneas here. It has enough speed to outspeed the Rayquaza. And then the rest is all into bulk. I prioritize defense here mainly because I want an opportunity to live a plus one life orb dragon ascent from a speed boosting nature of Rayquaza in case I get into that situation. And that's another situation where I don't want to go for Leaf Storm early because it just lets his Rayquaza come in and get up a boosting move. Um, that much bulk on Xerneas also allows it to be in the back in case I don't have to bring it in. Having Calm Mind Moonblast in the back that is a potential win con, but really it's more like a just a buffer in case I put myself in a poor position. Xerneas is another Pokemon that can basically take any one hit from anything on his team and come in. I've been going back and forth between Night Slash and Megahorn. Megahorn hits Wobbuffet harder, especially for a 2 KO, even with a timid nature. Whereas Night Slash doesn't hit Wobbuffet as hard, but it does give me something to hit the Aegis Slash with. And then, of course, Thunderbolt is just there to hit the Toxapex, primarily. But I end up clicking Moonblast more often than not. I do have an opportunity to set up Calm Mind on something like the Zirkatry, or the Magmortar, or to a lesser extent, the Gligar and the Wobbuffet. I have to be careful with Wobbuffet having Encore, of course. And that's more of a late game scenario that I've envisioned there. But just having that much bulk on Xerneas will allow me to kind of hit a uh, oh snap button if I need to. The, the plan is to not be in that position. I really need to maintain offensive pressure early on, which is why I don't have that many walls this week. Uh, just maintain that offensive pressure and hopefully force him to reveal what his sets are pretty quickly. Now after that, I am going to finally pull uh, just a small feather from the the page of MV or of Kyle A. I'm bringing Choice Bandit Fortress this week. And let me explain why. We have for Choice Band with Gyro Ball, HP Fire, Earthquake, and Volt Switch. Volt Switch might be switched for Explosion before the match. I'm not sure yet. But the idea there is that Fortress is almost always slower than um, the Aegislash. Aegislash would turn into its blade form, which of course has lower defenses hit my fortress with sacred sword or maybe a shadow ball or something like that fortress lives the hit and then i one hit ko him back with earthquake that scenario only happens if i either bring fortress in on a double as i'm expecting him to go into aegis slash because things like xerneas um do bait in the aegis slash so that is a very possible double i can make 
Alternatively, if uh, something goes down against the Aegislast, then I can bring in Fortress. Because uh, I don't think he would necessarily expect that. He just might expect me to get up hazards. Now, if he's in his blade form, Earthquake is a one-shot. If he's in the shield form, it's a two-shot. And I did take the time to rebreed once again HP Fire Fortress just because of the likelihood that Kartana is in against my Fortress. And Kartana would generally use Fortress as setup bait. So I'm not going to allow Kartana to do that. And I will immediately blast it with an HP Fire if it's in front of my Fortress. So that is the kind of the one. Um, I, I mean, I guess Xerneas is kind of like that too with the physical move on the Timid set. I don't know. For me, I'm less about being creative, especially if it doesn't necessarily help me. Like, just catching someone off guard isn't particularly useful to me, unless it's something effective. So, I think that Fortress can be very effective here. And speaking of effective, look at his team and look at Dark-type switch-ins. His only real switch-in is the Mega Lopunny. If that's not Mega Evolved, that's not a switch-in. So, we're running Hydreigon with the Darkinium Z for Dark Pulse, Draco Meteor, Taunt, and Roost. Again, I don't expect him to bring Toxapex or Wobbuffet or Gligar, but having Taunt in there stops them from doing their annoying shenanigans, and then I can use that as a free opportunity to roost. Uh, Draco Meteor is something, again, I have to be careful with it, or I will allow his Rayquaza a free setup, but this Hydreigon also outspeeds his Rayquaza. So if I get Hydreigon in, I am going to stick to the game plan this time of immediately hitting Darkinium Z, Unless I bring it in against, uh, if I brought it in against like a Paralyzed or a, a Burn Megalopony, then I would go for the Draco, but otherwise immediate Darkinium Z, um, just because I think that would be generally more effective. So that is the team. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know what you guys think, especially of the Banded Fortress and the the night slash Xerneas Zer, uh, there just a, a little bit of interesting sets this week we really have to play creative and bank off of um, I think Aaron's predilection to be a little bit more analytical with his prep uh, and I think in that we might be able to take advantage of his experience in doubles especially because I if I were him there's no way I don't think I ever see something like a uh, night slasher making a horn zerny is coming i don't see banded fortress coming um so we'll see how that goes thank you all so much for watching the team builder and let's go ahead and get into the battle Alrighty, so thank you for taking a moment to watch the team builder if you did in a brief overview of my team is going to be our dedicated lead double status rotom with hidden power fire for the kartana we have our uh, outraging, almost max speed, just enough speed to outspeed the Rayquaza Charizard. We have a very, very bulky Xerneas with Night Slash, Choice Man Fortress, a nice Assault Vest Tentacruel, and of course, Darkinium Z Taunt Roost uh, Hydreigon. Now, upon seeing his team just in the lead matchup, I was very kind of unsurprised by what I saw. Uh, Toxapex definitely could have come to this, but he also could have brought the same six that he has the first two weeks. Uh, for this matchup in particular, sticking to the game plan, leading with Rotom, and for this matchup, uh, for the ones that he brought, if he led Kartana, I could click that Hidden Power Fire. Otherwise, nothing really wants to get Will-O-Wisp. I can live any hit from the Law Punny, I can live a Fake Out into High Jump Kick, or Fake Out um, into Ice Punch even. So it was really just, all right, let's just go ahead and click off that will it was right away there. So thank you, Aaron, for the challenge, and we're going to get right into this battle. Now, as he leads off with his Mammal Swine, uh, of course, Scarf Icicle Crash was something that ran through my mind. But if he were Scarf Icicle Crash, then I definitely not only wanted to take advantage of the chance that he would miss, but I also wanted to take advantage of just setting up with something in the back if that were the case. He swaps right out to his Aegislash immediately, and I was like, great. One of my major issues in prep was whittling this thing down. Uh, so I immediately go out into my dedicated Aegislash switch in, which is my Assault Vest Tentacle here. I was thinking I would need to burn it with Scalds, but since he's already burned, I just want to whittle him a little bit. 
I did think about doubling out here expecting the king shield but I was like let me just put a little bit of damage on him even if he king shields I just want to get him at least in you know 30 to 40 percent there he really threw me off here and he just attacked again probably expecting me to swap out and then uh, that there there were just a lot of mind games at play there because I did not expect him to go for Shadow Ball two times in a row like that because I almost swapped out like back to Fortress or something like that. From the damage, I do know that he is most likely max special attack and uh, I just went for Scald again going, okay, I'm not going to swap out now just in case he tries to call my bluff and goes for it one more time. Just making sure. I did not want to do that. And then here, I just went ahead and went for a Scald, thinking that he might go for a coverage move, expecting me to swap up, which that coverage move could be Flash Cannon, or with the burn, it could be a Gyro Ball or something like that. Uh, he just goes for Shadow Ball again, and after that, I was like, all right, so now's a good time to switch out to Fortress, but if he is max special attack, Fortress can't take a hit and then get a chance to use its Earthquake, and so I just stayed in. Uh, he does just go for King Shield, so that was really a, an opportunity that I missed there. I could have gotten Fortress in, and he would have most likely expected me to set up rocks or something, and then I could have KO'd his Aegislash uh, with Earthquake. I did not take that opportunity, but on the plus side, the biggest annoyance on his team is now neutralized. Um, I did have to trade my Tentacruel for it, but Tentacruel was here just for the Aegislash. So I don't think that that's a terrible trade-off, honestly. Uh, just because of my general game plan and how difficult it was to get this thing whittled down in practice. Uh, and it really needed the burn to make it so because the leftovers that he had, it just stopped him from getting that extra recovery. So I go out here to have my Hydreigon. I have no need to click the Darkinium Z now because he's most likely just going to leave it in to get KO'd. And he goes out to his Law Punny. And I was like, okay. Is he going to go straight for the fake out or high jump kick? And so I end up staying in here predicting him to predict my fortress to come in. And he goes for return and I was like, oh great, this uh, Draco Meteor is going to hurt. And I almost knock him out actually, that does a lot of damage. And I was like, alright, so now I can swap out into my fortress because he's much more likely to go for high jump kick or maybe go for um, just return again. And he ends up going for return and I was like, that's perfect because now there's no way, even if he has fire punch, I'm not in range for fire punch to KO. But I was incorrect. So either he's adamant and I just called that incorrectly, he might've also gotten maximum damage on return and fire punch. But I was actually really surprised that I got KO'd there because he could have done maximum like 85% to my fortress, I believe. So uh, that was a little bit surprising. And since that happened, that means I have to let my Charizard take a huge hit just to get rid of this Law Punny. I could have set up a Dragon Dance right there, but number one, I was afraid of taking Return into Quick Attack and being in range of Mammoth Swine's Ice Shard. And so I was like, let's just get it out of the way because that won't free things up a lot easier for later. So Mammal Swine comes in, and I'm just going to go straight for Flare Blitz here. I knew that the recoil would KO me, but uh, afterwards I could have very easily gone into a number of things to revenge kill him, like Xerneas or anything like that, especially with Aegislash away. He makes a great prediction here and knows that I'm going to KO myself, and he goes for Stealth Rock. That means I could have roosted up and taken anything that Mammal Swine had, but that was a really good hard read to make, because if I had gone for Dragon Dance or anything... Um, I would have KO'd myself with the recoil at that range because Mammal Swine has so much HP. Now here I was expecting him to expect me to just go for a Moonblast, so I went for Calm Mind, knowing that I can two hit KO Toxapex with Thunderbolt after plus one. I would need like two minimum rolls to not two hit KO a max special defensive Toxapex. I was like, hey, all I need are two medium rolls and I knock out Toxapex. And so he goes down to his burn as I get a nice plus one on my special defense and my special attack and now we get to reveal Thunderbolt I was very close to running Thunder in this matchup but I kept missing in prep and so I just went for Thunderbolt knowing just not even a max I didn't even need a max roll I just needed two 
average rolls. The only way I could lose out in this situation really is having two minimum rolls. Uh, but he does get Toxic off on my Xerneas, which is pretty annoying. I need to make sure Xerneas is healthy in order to take an extreme speed from the Rayquaza. Unfortunately for me, in addition to that, I also get the minimum roll on the secondary uh, Thunderbolt, which I guess is my just desserts for getting a burn on Mamoswine. But the way that he played the Mamoswine, the burn didn't really matter, so I would have gladly not burned his Mamoswine in exchange for uh, not being in the position where I'm getting a minimum roll. Now right here, I do a hard swap out, expecting him to just recover again, because I have to keep my Xerneas more healthy than this. And so I can reset the toxic counter, and I go, okay, surely he's going to either recover, expecting my Z move, or he's going to toxic me. But both of those are completely wrong, and he pulls out Ice Beam, and I had another opportunity to just roost. I could have also thrown off my Z move there, so that was just a huge misplay on my part. I thought for sure he was going to make a, another good hard read there because he didn't have there were several opportunities in this battle where he didn't have to make hard reads where he did and now I'm just back in the same position that I was in but I don't have Hydreigon so I go back into Xerneas get the calm mind off again and now I'm going to be missing a lot of HP now this is still not a, a losing position specifically if say his Rayquaza is scarfed or banded and it gets locked into a move then I can still do something with this. So right there we see the amount of damage that I do. That was more like a, a higher roll right there. And I was like, okay, I'm still out of range unless he's like a banded Rayquaza, then I have to worry about extreme speed. Um, but after all this toxic damage just piling up on me, especially switching into Stealth Rocks twice, it's just too much residual damage for Xerneas to be able to take on Rayquaza. Not to mention he has Kartana in the back. Now with Kartana, I was like, my only play here, if I want to win this, is to bank on the fact that his Rayquaza might be locked into a move. And so, Kartana is what I expect to come in. It does come in, and that means I'm going directly to my Rotom. Uh, I actually bred this Rotom from 13, the Rotom, which is uh, the Rotom that Tom squashed in the last season of the GBA. Uh, so this is like, it kind of gets to, to <laughs> impart that spirit to this new Rotom. Uh, based on that damage, I was like, is he scarfed? Because I wasn't expecting him to do that. And he goes for Leaf Blade again, which means he is most definitely locked in. And so I just get to drop Kartana with a Hidden Power Fire. Now, for his Rayquaza to knock out this Rotom from this range, he has to go for Outrage slash Dragon Ascent or Appropriate Fire Coverage move. And if he is locked into that move, then that means my Xerneas comes back in and it can Revenge Kill. So this was the only end game that I could foresee. He does go for Dragon Ascent, and I was like, oh yes, please be locked in on that. Please, 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 because then that means I win. Because if he's, um, well, if he's if he were Scarf, then I still lose from this range. But if he were Banded, or if he didn't bring Extreme Speed, then I win. All I have to do is click Moonblast. And unfortunately for me, he is not locked in, and he just goes for Extreme Speed and picks me off. Ah, uh, so that means we take our first loss in Season 9 of the GBA. Thank you very much, Aaron, for the battle. Uh, like I mentioned to you when we were chatting, it was so much fun prepping for you. I put so much, I bred so many sets that I didn't use. I, I worked really, really hard on this, and it felt really good for it to come down to that. Now, my misplays here, number one with the Hydreigon, I don't know if it mattered I guess it mattered in the sense that I might have had a very healthy Hydreigon that would have outsped his um, his uh, Rayquaza if I had roosted up a lot. But then we're playing like a taunt roost game. He might have gotten a Toxic off on me because I would have roosted. Ice Beam did around 30% max, so I would have gotten a little bit back. But he would have seen what I was doing and probably Toxic me somewhere in there. And then the other misplay that I think... Um, made a big difference here is going into Fortress the way that I did. I should have brought it in on the Aegislash much earlier, uh, predicting a King Shield is where I could have made a big difference there. Uh, just because bringing it in on King Shield, I don't take any damage coming in. He switches back to his blade form, goes for Shadow Ball. I live that guaranteed because of either Sturdy or 
even a max special attack Aegis Slash wasn't knocking me down to my sturdy on that uh, build. And then I KO him with Earthquake. Then my Charizard is much more healthy in that scenario and not having to take a return from Law Punny. Uh, but I do think getting the, the max roll that he did off of his Fire Punch and maybe return helped him out there too. Alongside me losing so much HP against his Toxapex because I got those minimum rolls the first time around. But either way, I did enjoy this battle a lot. So uh, that was our, I think that was our first conference battle. And Aaron was the only other person in our conference who was undefeated. So I'll drop there. But I think we even, that I'm below him in the overall ranking just because of the win-loss record. But he and I have the same differential because I only lost one here. But I am really happy I got to click a hidden power because those are a pain in the butt to breed for and then level up to level 100 to max out the other IVs. And I, f I got to click one of them this time. I didn't get to click Hidden Power Fire on Fortress, but I got to click it on my Rotom. So that was very satisfying. Uh, another shout out. Thank you again, Goldoa Dragon, for recording my battle for me. Thank you all for watching this matchup. Next week, week four, we're going up against Mewtwo fan Nate. And... Uh, that's going to be another tough one because he has access to Mewtwo and Naga Nadal. So we definitely need to prepare very carefully for facing Mewtwo just because of the sheer breadth of sets and power that the thing has. But thank you all again for watching. I had so much fun prepping for this battle and playing it. Uh, outside of those few misplays, I, I really felt good about this match. <sighs> this is why we play Pokemon. This is why I play Pokemon. I don't know. Tell me if you all were entertained by the battle. Um, let me know if I could have played this differently too. I really appreciate the insight and the retrospective of a loss and learning where you could have played a little bit differently. I do look forward to your comments in that regard. Thank you for taking the time to leave them too. I do appreciate you all. Have a good day, guys. I'll talk to you soon. Bye now.